So we'll be sharing over the next couple of weeks or a few weeks um, just bits and pieces of what God has done and what God is continuing to do that's so we can hear from him. Bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. And um, I'm not going to be long this morning, but I just felt that I had to share um, what's on my heart. Um, we're still all jet lagged and we're all messed up still and all that good stuff. But just had to share just um, this one thing that the Lord is doing in me that I want you to see in Scripture as we kind of debrief about what God has done. So Holy Spirit, we thank you for you being God. We thank you for how you are moving, for what you're doing, what you have done, and what you continue to do. We lift your name on high, Lord. We exalt you because you're the great I am. We thank you for the fact that eight months into the year, people are still coming to a relationship with you. So it's a historic moment in the life of this church, and we're humbled by that. And we thank you for that, Lord. Let us continue to be on the battlefield, spreading the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So open our hearts to hear, open our hearts to receive, open our hearts to be in tune. Um, I pray for clarity of speech, soundness of mind so that I can effectively communicate what you are depositing in me. And I'm using the word depositing because you're continuing to speak even in the moment as I stand in front of people. So Felix dies. Felix really has nothing to say. We want the Holy Spirit to be the preacher and to be the speaker and just to be the communicator this morning, God. So touch our hearts to align with you as we give it all to you. So we bless you, we praise you, we worship, and we adore you. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Amen. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 10. And I had a plan. <laughs> a plan mean um, when I begin the year, I have a preaching calendar that we kind of go through. And ordinarily, we try to stick to the calendar um, as best as possible. And so next Sunday, I'm supposed to be beginning a series on the book of Philippians. But um, I'm kind of messed up right now, <laughs> you know, uh, messed up in I don't know what kind of way it is. Uh, God is really um, tugging at my heart from a completely different perspective, and I am processing and processing and processing and processing. You know, um, when you prepare to go on mission trip, I think this is my fifth mission trip abroad, and you prepare, uh, a lot of times you know what you're going to do, a lot of times you know what's expected of you, um, but I think this time God tugged at my heart completely differently and, and showed me some things that has just messed me up. Um, I kind of feel like John on the island of Patmos, you know, when John was banned to the island of Patmos and God took him up to the third heaven and showed him some things. Um, I felt like God took me to Malawi to show me some things and it's messing me up. And I want to begin to share um, some of that with you through scripture. And I'm praying that I can communicate it effectively, um, just the little bits and pieces, and then we'll flesh it out in the upcoming weeks to see what God says and what God wants done. But I will say this before I read the scripture. Um, life in America skews the poverty that exists in the rest of the world. It really does, it really, really does. Um, I understand now um, more and more why everybody is dying to come to America because in a sense, America literally is heaven. In a sense it is. For us, it might be hell, <laughs> but for the rest of the world, it's, it's heaven. I mean, you know, I understand now why a person will give up their life in a third world country to come here and to work for minimum wage. I understand it. And I understand now why they will work for minimum wage for a little while and then send the minimum wage back home to their families that are back home I get it. I, I, understand, I understand now because in their world, minimum wage is more than the well-paid person is making. I get it. I, I really, really, really do. And the thing that really has me messed up is, is Christian perspective, especially in America, on um, local and global missions. I'll use those two words from time to time, hopefully to communicate what I want to communicate. I am going to say... Um, well, not, I'm not going to say we don't get it. I'm going to say I don't get it. I'm going to say that. I don't get it. 
And, and God is starting to show me more and more what it's all about. Um, the little that we do, we think that's it. And we think we're doing good, you know, but I don't think we're doing it yet. And um, I think the church has a very, very long ways to go as it relates to God called them to do and to really um, living life and being on mission with God and doing what all God would call us to do. So today's, the purpose of today's message is to really open our eyes a little bit more um, prayerfully to get us on board with God as it relates to what God is saying and doing and joining him in his work. So um, go with me to the book of Luke chapter 10. And if um, our team can put um, my big idea on the screen, I want to just share that with you. And um, we can kind of walk through that to allow God to be God in our midst. The big idea basically says this, and what this is is just me summarizing what I believe the one thing that Luke chapter 10 verses 1 through 20 is trying to communicate. And that is every Christian is commissioned to work with God in providing solutions to life's challenges while proclaiming God's reign in the earth. Um, That statement might not make sense to you right now, but it's got me messed up. And I I got it from driving through the villages and townships, and um, Blantyre was the one major city we were in, but to the Varian township that we saw and um, the Varian villages that we had a chance to pass through and the poverty that we saw. I'll begin by saying I um, left there saying, what can we do? (laughs) Because preaching is not enough. Yeah, I'm jacked up because I'm a preacher, you know. um, Let me illustrate with this, then we'll walk into the Word and we'll kind of just walk through it. If I were to go to, um, and I've said this before if you've been here on Wednesday night, to um, the Philippines and I preach the gospel to a prostitute and she gives her life to Christ, um, what do I do with her the next day? She has to go to work. Preaching is not enough. So I'm going to say every Christian were commissioned to work with God in providing solutions to life challenges while proclaiming God's reign in the earth. What we do in church is we preach, we sing, we worship, we do all that good stuff, and nothing wrong with that. It's good. I think God is telling me it's not enough. It's not enough. And that's why people aren't being drawn to the faith, because all we do is preach to them and sing to them. And it's not enough to help them live life. Does this make sense? And so I kind of want to walk through that. So verse 10, um, let me just read a little bit, then we'll walk through this to kind of hear what God is saying. And then um, go to the next slide real quick. So I want to just pick up on the piece with um, uh, breakout evangelism. This is going to be what we're going to be talking about, Mission Possible. And I'm curious. I created a hashtag. And what I want to do is I want to know what you're feeling through the message, what you're feeling, what you're sensing, because I'm in a funky place and I don't know what to do with it. Um, so use that hashtag, RCF Worship Mission Possible, if you're a Facebook person or Twitter, just to say whatever you're feeling so we can kind of grab that together. Verse 1 opens up by saying this, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he was about to go. Let me keep reading. And he said, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. In verse 3 he says, Go your way, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. And then verse 4 he says, You're going to be broke. Um, (laughs) Amen. That's why we don't have too many missionaries. Um, I don't know that I can do it. After this. Come on, say after this. this. For you to find out what the after this is, you have to read chapter 9 in its entirety. Because in chapter 9, Jesus kind of lays out a picture of the ministry work that he's doing. But pointedly, go with me to chapter 9, specifically verse 57. I want to read these few verses just to paint a picture 
of, of why Jesus began by saying after this and then him sending out or commissioning people to go and work with God in providing solutions to life challenges while proclaiming the reign of God in the earth. And I'm going to try to move briefly because I think I need to flesh this out for a few weeks. Verse 57 says, as they were going along the road, this is Jesus, and you have to know with me when Jesus is walking, there's always a crowd following him. There's a group of people walking along with him. As he was going, someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Sounds just like us, doesn't it? We hear a good word. We're emotional. We hear something. Lord, send me. I'll go. I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. And here's what Jesus said. And he said to them, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And to another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you. Lord, but let me first go say farewell to those at my home. Look at verse 62. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Church, that is harsh. Amen. That is harsh. My wife just lost her mom, and the biggest tension that we had in our home was knowing that this Malawi trip was coming up. We had done all this fundraising. Um, you have given sacrificially. And then we don't know what would happen if we go on the trip. And let's say mom passes. What would I do with my wife in Africa? Thousands and thousands. It, it was a very, very difficult time. But I can't imagine us praying to God and saying, Lord, should we go? Should we stay? Or should we stay? And his response being, let the dead bury the dead. Gone and go. That's harsh. Y'all quit being religious on me. That's difficult. Because here's what you would say to me, how insensitive. Are you with me? Um, do you plan on being married? Do you care? Do you whatever? I mean, and then along the line, somebody else says, well, let me at least go home and say farewell to my brothers and sisters. And Jesus' response is almost like this. If you leave now, you're not fit for the kingdom uh, because nobody who puts their hands to the plow and turn back is fit to do what I call them to do. Dang. I'm like, come on, G. You know? <laughs> You know, this is like, this is harsh stuff. This is harsh stuff. It's really, really hard. So he says all these challenging and all these difficult words and all these tough things to his disciples and to those who were following him. And you must understand, he was speaking to a lot more than the 12 that were with him. The crowds were large and people heard this. On one occasion, his disciples said to him, Lord, who then can be a Christian? Who then can be a follower? I mean, because he was raising and he was saying some very, very difficult thing. And I'm saying this to say to you, America has so skewed us that if Jesus were to say that to us or some preacher were to say that to you, you'd call social services or civil rights or something on him and say he done gone mad. But I've seen now in third world places, people are willing to do this because they love God so. Man, I messed up. <laughs> I don't know that I could do it, right? And so look at what he did. After this, he sent out 72 others. Matter of fact, let me, put, 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 let me say this to you first of all. Every person in here, we need to know, put the first point on the screen that we're called and we're commissioned um, to reach our communities for Christ. Okay, say, I am called, I am called to reach my community, to reach my community for, Christ. for Christ. That's the first thing I want you to take away as it relates to the fact that we're doing this mission and the mission is possible, okay? So he sends out 72. Um, some of your translation, depending on whether it's a newer translation or older translation, has 70 in it. Like the King James or the NASB or the ASV, they, they say 70, but your newer translation who had different manuscripts say 72. And he sent them, and watch this now, watch this, watch this. This is very, very important. I can tell you right now I'm not going to make it through this message because I want you all to see this. He sent them out ahead of him, how? Two by two into what? Every town and place where he himself was about to go, okay? Very, very important statement because 
Having been in, in the experiences that we had the past 14 days have illumined my eyes to scriptures because when you go in a context that's very, very close to the life of Palestine or life back in Jesus' day, all of a sudden the word becomes real and it starts to make sense. Notice what the text says. He sent them out two by two to prepare the way for places that he was about to go. Okay? What the text is saying is that Jesus was not saying to them so much, go and take me there. He was essentially saying, go ahead of me and then prepare the way so that when I come, people can receive me. We don't get this as a church, and I'm hoping I can communicate this clearly. We want to go bringing Jesus without having prepared the way. This is jacking me up. Go first, and, and, and you know how it was in the Old Testament, let the, the witness or the testimony be established by two people. So he was saying, when you go, by virtue of the fact that there's two of you, and you start doing what you're supposed to be doing, it, it's going to be verifiable, it's going to be voracious, and they're going to see this truth. But go prepare the way so that when I come where you have been, the people will be more receptive. Does this make sense? Okay, very, very important. So, so say, go first, then Jesus can come second. Now, now listen to me. I know God is omnipotent. I know God is omnipresent. I know God is everywhere at the same time. I know the fact exists that you can't go nowhere where God is. I understand all of that. I understand all of that quite well. But the principle still stands in the text where he says to them, you go first and prepare the way, and then I'm going to come where you have prepared. Does this make sense? Okay? And then notice what he says. Here's why I want you to go. And he says to them that the harvest then is plentiful, but the laborers are few. In other words, I'm having a hard time finding people that's willing to go ahead and prepare the way because it's going to inconvenience them. Now, the issue, the issue is not the harvest. The people are ready. The problem is the laborers going out into the field to reap the harvest because the harvest field won't look like where you live. Come on, say amen if you're here with me. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And he says, therefore, pray earnestly for the Lord of the harvest that he may send out laborers into the harvest. And then look at verse 3. He says, go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lamb in the midst of wolves. Man, I like that. 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 I'm sending you into places that you won't always have the answer. You won't be the sharpest thing. I need you to exercise, listen to the term, a great level of humility in the places where I'm going to be sending you, yet and still, you've got to be shrewd enough to deal with what I'm sending you to do. Now, here's the dominant reason that I messed up. I encountered Muslim culture, and it messed me up. Let me tell you why it messed me up. We, we, um, we drove through a lot of towns, and we drove through a lot of villages, and um, we spent some time in Blantyre and some other town. Now, here's what you need to know about um, the way this thing is structured. The, the, t- the city is, is the major big place where, where commerce is happening. What the township is, it's people who have left life in the village to try to make it in the city, but they couldn't quite make it in the city or get in, so they live on the outskirts of the city with life that's a little better than life in the village, but man, it is worse than the worst thing you can think of here. We're going to show you some pictures, Okay. So they're living on the periphery there. Then on the outside of that is the villages or the villages themselves where life is, I can't describe it. We just have to show you pictures. It's really, really bad. Here's what messed me up. In the city, I saw a lot of Christian churches. I mean, Assemblies of God, Baptists, Seventh-day Adventists, Charismatic, you name it. In the city with nice fancy buildings, paved parking lot, people well-dressed, you name it, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. As we left the city and we went into the South Township, I saw fewer churches, maybe one or two, depending on where I was. But here's the thing that really started to mess me up. 
I saw a lot of Muslim mosques. I didn't see a lot of mosques in the city. One big temple here and there, new ones being built. But in the township, man, I saw gobs and gobs of mosques. Okay? Then, here's the thing that I saw around the majority of the mosques. I want to say just about everyone, unless I'm wrong, they had a well that was beautiful. Nice pumped, you know, and the people would go to the well and get water, but the well was right next to the mosque. Y'all going to get this in a while. As I went farther out into the villages, specifically the one large village that I saw, which was close to the, I think it's called the Mvu Lodge where we went on this safari, huge, huge village, I saw no Christian churches, none. And I saw tons of mosques again in the village. Can I get what I'm saying? And inevitably, same picture, wells by every village, okay? So here's what that said to me, is that if I'm living in poverty and water is a dominant resource, before I listen to you, you get it, I'm looking for a physical need to be met, right? And here's where I'm jacked up. The Muslim went ahead and prepared the way So that when they came, the people would listen because the needs were being, yeah, you got it. Then when I went to the outer villages where, I mean, I'm talking just bad stuff. Um, Just bad stuff. Just bad. Where it's just terrible living conditions. No, if very few, maybe solar panels, not electrical stuff, none of that kind of stuff. I see the same thing. I see the mosque, and I see the well, and I see people around the mosque, but they're not around the mosque for the mosque. They're around the mosque for the well. So when the person on the inside of the mosque come out and tell them about this Allah that they serve, the response is a lot easier because needs are being met. You kind of get what I'm saying? But my challenge is, so, so we went on this safari, and on the safari I spoke to one of the employees, and I asked him where he lived. He says, I lived in the village um, just outside that you passed through. I asked him pointedly, um, what's the dominant faith there? He says, oh, it's Muslims all over the place, and the Catholics have a few schools there. So I said, are there any Christian churches there? And he says, man, to find the closest Christian church, you're going to have to go way, way, way back to the town. This is what the guy said. So I said, are you Muslim? And he says, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not with that. But here's the problem. Nobody's preparing the way. <laughs> but when we show up, we'll want to preach. You guys are getting it now, right? And you want to know why they won't hear, because for us, Christianity is all about the proclamation of the gospel and not the healing of the sick. And I messed up because we do good church, but we have very few wells in our community. (laughs) You kind of get what I'm saying? We do good church, we do good church, we do good church because I work hard for my money and I dare not give it to somebody else who don't have. So the church is not so much focused on meeting the needs, realizing that we're commissioned by God to reach our community, to work where God is already working, to partner with him. Now this is why I am so messed up, okay, because I I understand the principle that says Find out where God is working and join him in what he's already doing. And and, and my point is, if there's needs in community and God is by his sovereignty meeting his needs, why can't the church go along and serve people where they are, then proclaim the reign of the kingdom of God? I I really want y'all to process that with me because I'm messed up right now. And it's difficult for me to understand. So let me walk through this. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers, the laborers, the laborers is the problem. The laborers are a problem. And not only overseas, in Aurora where we live, in Denver where we live, in Parker where we live. You kind of get what I'm saying? Okay? So pray that the Lord would send laborers into the harvest. And then he says, go, I'm sending you a sheep about wolves. And look at verse 4. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. That's why we don't go. 
I can't take my bends. <laughs> what am I going to eat? Girl, I got to have me a shower. I'm, I'm using extreme terms because we need that we, we have needs that we must have, and believe it or not, those things transcend us obeying the command of God. My needs comes before the will of God. So, leave it behind. And then here's the worst part. Look at verse 5. And whatever house you enter, first say peace to that house. And if a son of peace is there, you and your peace will rest upon it. But if not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking. What they provide for the laborer is worthy of his ages. wages. Do not go from house to house. Verse 8. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Don't say amen too quick. Don't. I'm telling y'all don't. One of the greatest honor we received while in Malawi was we went to a Chilimoni church and we ministered there. That's where the youth camp was. And we met one of the leading families of the church. And the family invited us to their home for dinner. I'm coming back to that. The first Sunday we went to a church called a Sosi Church. And at that church, um, the plan was we were going to eat with the people and fellowship with them. So the church prepared a great meal for us. And being the Americans that we are, we looked into the distance and we saw the nice table. We saw the beautiful place settings with the, 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 um, the plate, the so on and so forth. And then as is the culture of the Malawians before the meal, the young ladies came with the water basin and they poured the water and they bowed and we washed our hands. And we're like, oh man, this is going to be good. And so we took our plate and they brought it and then um, we had to serve ourselves the move. Um, number one uh, problem was, and I'm going to pick on Annie for a little while because we're talking about the trip. Um, Annie said, what's that? And, and somebody said, oh, that's goat. Oh, Lord Jesus. You know, um, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, ink, she got to leave the mission field, right? <laughs> she went, and she is freaking out. So, the rest of us, uh, I'm just going to do the rice. I'm going to do the beans. This is Annie. And we're like, Annie, try it. Um, you know, see what it is. It's going to be good. You couldn't pay her. So, our plates have food. So, we're like, hey, they forgot to bring the silverware. Once again, Annie, what is I'm going to eat with? <laughs> right? There you go. You kind of make your own fork. You kind of get it. Um, we made it through that experience. And then um, we go to the second home. Nice family. I mean, we just love this family to death. They served us fish, chicken, goat once again. Um, just the most delicious stuff. The problem with the fish is it had the head on it. I'm like, Annie, you going to eat? No, the fish looking at me. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, Annie is good. She said, no, I can see the eyes and the eyes can see me. <laughs> so I'm like, you have to try to see. She didn't try nothing. Jamal, check how much she weighs. She might have lost a whole lot of weight. <laughs> but, but, but I use that illustration to say that the call of God is going to cause us to go places that is uncomfortable to our cultural norm. And if the command, I mean, let, let, me, let me contextualize this even more. The reason we won't go to the drug dealer is because we know there's marijuana in the house and we're so spiritual, we don't want the smoke on us. The reason we won't go to the wine is because we know there's alcoholic, alcohol in the house and we won't want that. The re, come on, are you hearing me? The reason we don't go to the places that God is sending us to go is because we fool ourselves into thinking that our culture being dominant culture is it and God sure enough can't be there because it's all about me and not where God is sending me and it messes us up so you're going to have to go places do things all that stuff that's just counter-cultural and what do we do with that right let me keep reading let me keep reading and then so eat whatever is said before you and just, just fitting with the culture. So it was a great ex That's when I think, this is the last thing I'm saying, I'm going to go to the second point. That's where I said, I don't know that a lot of us are really ready to go on mission trip. 
Y'all all all read about Katani's bathroom story. (laughs) That's real. All right? So, So number one... I need you to to understand this, that we're commissioned to our communities, be it abroad or be it local. So let me say local and globally, we have to go do what God tells us to do. Now, the reason we go, the reason we go, put the second slide on the screen. I want you all to see this. The reason we go is that, um, number two, put the second one up, is that the objective of the mission, notice how I'm going to say this, is to provide solutions to life's challenges while proclaiming the reign of God on the earth. Let me flesh this out for a little while, then I'm going to say the third thing, and we're going to land. I'm not, I'm, I might come back to this next week, okay? Look at verse 9. When you go, heal the sick in it, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come where? Near you, okay? But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go in its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to your feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that town, um, on, on that day for Sodom than for that town. Look at verse 13. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in judgment for Tyre and Sidon than you. And for you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven, and you shall be brought down to Hades. And look at verse 16. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Now, back up to verse 9, and this is the the point here that has me in a just really messed up place. Verse 9 says, when you go into this place that I'm sending you two by two, I need you to do two things. First of all, I want you to heal the sick, and while you're healing the sick, proclaim the reign of God's kingdom or the kingdom of God is near you. And this is the part that I'm processing really, really well. Because the call and the mandate is to go and make disciples. But the tension that has existed in the church for a very, very, very long time. Do we feed them first, then tell them the gospel? Or do we force them to the gospel, then feed them afterwards? And I'm leaning more and more to the point that unless we meet people where they are, they're not open to receive the God that we're telling them about. I mean, this, this thing has me messed up, okay? I don't want y'all to think that I am pro-Muslim and none of that stuff, but I think the Muslims have it figured out. You wonder why the majority of our black males will go to prison and then while in prison they come out Muslim? It's because in there, the Muslims are in there meeting, I wish I had somebody in here, meeting needs that the normal culture isn't doing so that when they present their gospel to them, people are more receptive. It's no no different than in our urban context in the Chicago's and the New York's and those inner cities of our world. They go in there and they deposit wells and they quench your thirst first. Every town, guys, every town there's a well. Every town. Nice well. Not a hole in the ground. Nice well. Right next to the well is this beautiful mosque, or mosque. Call it beautiful, whatever you want to call it. And if the needs are being met. So here is the point. I don't know if they can put that big idea. Work with God in providing solutions to life's problems. My marriage is jacked up. Here's what we say. Oh, just accept Christ. You'll be fine. No. I need to learn how to live. I need to learn how to communicate. If I see you're interested in me, I'm more open to hearing the God that you're serving. I'm hungry. Going down to the welfare office. You ain't a member of this church. The sad sad commentary is, a lot of churches, when you call for help, that's what you hear. Okay? They're not interested in healing the sick unless the sick tides first. (laughs) 
I have no place to sleep. I'm in a homeless shelter. And here's what we say. Go down to this house. We don't dare think. Oh, the first question we ask, have you accepted Christ yet? Are you saved? Are you whatever? And, 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 and if I'm in a dire situation and I know you have what I need and you tell me about your God and I know if I say yes to your God that you're going to take care, I'm going to get saved all day long so I can have a place to sleep. But it's going to wear off. It won't stick. But if I know that you legitimately care about me, I thank God that when he met the woman that was caught in adultery, the first thing he said to her was, go and sin no more. I wish I had somebody in here. I thank God that the moment he read, he ran into Jairus' daughter that was dead. He didn't ask her, are you going to heaven before I raise you? He raised her first. The first time he encountered the leper and blind Bartimaeus. Come on, you know this. He didn't ask them about their relationship and if they wanted to be saved. He opened up their dog on eyes. He gave them lead to walk. He fed the 5,000. He healed the sick. And when they saw that Jesus cared about them, they were willing to hear. I'm concerned. Does our church really care about our community? Or we're more concerned about us having church? We have a great vision, but it ain't happening yet. What's up? Right? You kind of get what I'm saying? Heal the sick. Heal the sick. Heal the sick. Heal the sick. And then watch this. While you're healing the sick, proclaim the kingdom of God or the reign of God in the earth. Man, why do you do this? Well, because I love God, man. And I understand that he died for my sin. Why do you keep coming after me? Because I care about God. And God cares about you. But let the question be birthed out of the healing and the miraculous work of God. Not that you try, you better be saved so you can be healed. I'm processing. You guys are trekking with me? So, so number two, go back to the, the second point, please. I want to talk through that real quick because I want you all to see it. The next one right here. The objective is to provide solutions to life challenges while proclaiming the reign of God in the earth. I'm going to hit that third one. I'm going to stop. So here's my question that I'm asking myself. What problem is Restoration Christian Fellowship fixing in the community where it's located? That's what I'm asking. What problem are we fixing? Because if we close our doors and go away, will the community say, no, 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 you are fixing this. Don't shut the well down because we need to have water. Or will they say, we didn't even know you were there. There's a church on six? Really? That's embarrassing to the kingdom of God. Make sense? Now, look at the third thing. Go to the third third point real quick. And I want you all to hear this because this is messing me up too, and I'll talk about it. The success of the mission is not based on the defeat of the enemy, but the salvation of what? Yeah, yeah. Let's read. Let me talk about it. So, verse 17. So, they came back from Malawi. (laughs) <laughs> and they returned with stories and pictures and joy. They came back and they said, Lord, man, what had happened was, wherever we went, the move of God, the miraculous, we saw it all happen. Man, we fed 50 people, we did this, we did that, we did all that, all that stuff we did. And Jesus said, Yeah, heal the sick, but it's not about healing the sick. It's about bringing souls into the kingdom. Watch this. So he says here, the 72 return, Lord, even the demons, they say, are subject to your name. Verse 18, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like what? Lightning from what? Heaven. And look at verse 19. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Okay? Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written where? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let, let me, let me, let me flesh that out, then I'm going to stop. 
During our time in Malawi, we had over 30 kids, young adults that I know of, uh, might be more, gave their life to Christ. Great, great, great stuff. Exciting, exciting, exciting stuff, right? But then notice what Jesus says, because that's what it's all about. Verse 18, he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, okay? And then he says this, and I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. So here's what verse 18 is saying. Listen, demons are supposed to run from you by default. By default, because I have given you authority over them to tramp on them such that nothing can harm you. So whenever you show up, the enemy has no rule, has no domain over you because nothing can hurt you because I've given it to you. Okay? Now watch the phrase. Watch the phrase. He says, I saw Satan fall. Come on, say, I saw Satan fall. Everybody said again. Say, I saw Satan fall. One more time. I saw Satan fall. Here's what the Greek grammar implies in that verb to see. It's written in the imperfect tense, and here's what that says. Something that happened in the past, and it has continuing action into the future. So here's what Jesus is saying. Hey, (laughs) that might be surprising to you, but you're supposed to go... And in your going, the goal is because you prepare the way for me to show up, by default, you're tearing down the kingdom of Satan in his own domain. So in the past, I saw Satan fall when he was in heaven because God was there. God kicked him out. In the present, you notice wherever I show up, he disappears. I'm demolishing his kingdom. In the future, in the eschaton or the end of time, his kingdom will be demolished. So here's what I want you all to do. I am sending you out as sheep among wolves, and when you show up, Satan has to flee, and that is how we're going to tear his kingdom down. So, 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 you tear his kingdom down by bringing people to a relationship with me because when I enter them, no demon in hell can live where I live. I wish I had somebody in here. No demon can stay where I stay. So your goal in this fight against the devils of this world is not to to try to approach the demon. No, 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 no. When you show up, they run. But proclaim the gospel. So I have this crazy theology of missions now. Hear it real quick and I'm going to stop. Hmm. The Muslims have built the well, and, and I'll contextualize it. What's wrong with me going to where the Muslims' well are? And working there because who's to say God isn't using the Muslim to meet the need, and then all I have to do is work where God is, and my theology tells me, Christian, Muslim, in time, the Christian is going to win. I wish I had somebody in here because of what's in the Christian. You get what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? So, because a lot of time our missiology calls for us feeling we have to do everything, and if the goal is to work where God is already working, why can't we find out what God is doing in our local communities and work with God, and greater is he that is where than he that is where? Y'all know the scripture quite well. So here's what he said. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. He says, I am sending you to places that I'm about to come, so by the time I come, they are ready to receive me because you've been there. I'm processing that. I'm processing that. I think, Brenda, we call it collaborative partnership, right? That's what we call it. That's what we we talk to it about. Why can't our missions look like that? What is God doing in your neighborhood that might not look like you, that might not dress like you, that might not smell like you, that he's sending you to, to go there so he can work through you to bring those people to our relationship with him? Here's the big idea, right? Every believer is commissioned by God to work with God in providing solutions to life's challenges while proclaiming the kingdom of God in the earth realm. Mission is possible. The thing that makes the mission impossible is that the enemy is not going to sit still. 
and let you come in. <laughs> He's going to fight, but you've already won because we're fighting from posture of victory. Does this make sense? We're fighting from a position of victory. So you all, my missiology is changing. I am I'm growing. I am stretching. And as I ask God, what's he doing in our community here in Aurora, here in Denver, um, why do you have Restoration Christian Fellowship here? And what problems are we here to fix? And who are we to work with? And what are you already doing that we can proclaim the reign of God on that thing? And then globally, 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 I am still processing Malawi. Lord, what do you want us to do there? Because it's a both and. It's not an either or. It's a both and. It's a both and. And I think God is challenging all of us today when we go home and when we go to work Monday, that demon that's been sitting next to you, And you've been bringing oil and putting it right between your cubicle and theirs. Take the oil down and you with the oil in you. Gone over there. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? I am sending you out as sheep amongst wolves. Heal the sick and proclaim the reign of the kingdom of God. I'm going to say to you the mission is possible. But we must be willing, and it is not easy. Bow your heads with me. Bow your heads with me. Lord, you're an awesome God. Pray for the Lord of harvest that he would send laborers out into the vineyard. Let us be more of a missional church, Lord. What are you doing and where are you calling us to work with you? Thank you for this experience that we've had. It's life-changing. We can't wait to continue to share stories and images and just what you're doing there to hear the experiences of everyone who went on the team. I thank you for the challenge in my personal life. I have a sheep to lead, both internally in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, but at the same time, we've got to motivate them to go to the ends of the earth, Lord. So we come against the comfort of our society. Open our hearts. Open our hearts to hear. As we process this message this morning, we thank you for the baptisms today. That's what it's all about. Meet people where they live and proclaim the reign of God. So we take a moment just to worship you before we leave, God, to celebrate you. I am praying that nothing was said that would be confusing to anyone, that it would be clarified, Lord. If something was offensive, throw it away, but open our hearts to hear. Open our hearts to hear. Missions is really modeled in Scripture. Sometimes we make it more difficult than it should be. Forgive us, God. And thank you for convicting us. You're a wonderful God. Bless your name, Lord. You're awesome in this place.